Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us for Vaping, the Health Effects with the Program Spotlight on Catch My Breath. Today's webinar is presented by the Great Lakes ATTC, the Great Lakes MHTTC, and the Great Lakes PTTC. The Great Lakes ATTC, MHTTC, and PTTC are all funded by SAMHSA to support the behavioral health workforce in the Health and Human Services Region Number 5, which includes Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, Minnesota, Ohio, and Wisconsin. Um, our work is supported by the three separate grants. And all materials in this presentation um, will be public domain, um, but they, they may be reproduced or copied without permission. Um, and at this time, um, the opinions expressed in this webinar are of those of the speaker and do not necessarily reflect the official position of um, SAMHSA. Our webinar format today will be recorded and available along with the PowerPoint slides on all three of our websites for the Great Lakes ATTC, MHTTC, and PTTC. Um, today's audio will be broadcast through your computer speakers, so please make sure that they are turned on and up. There will be no call-in number available. You may use the chat box feature throughout the webinar to ask questions or add comments. We will have a brief Q&A session after each of the speakers. Our speakers today are Megan Piper. Megan Piper, PhD, is an associate professor in the University of Wisconsin Department of Medicine and an associate director of research at UWC3. Dr. Piper's research focuses on understanding and treating tobacco dependence with an additional interest in different populations of smokers who have more difficulty quitting, such as women and smokers with mental illness. In 2019, she was named the recipient of the Faculty Excellence in Research Award. In 2014, Dr. Piper received the Russell Jarvik Young Investigator Award for her contributions to the field from the Society of Research and on Nicotine and Tobacco. She serves as an associate editor for the Journal of Nicotine and Tobacco Research. A Madison native, Dr. Piper completed her undergraduate degree in chemistry at Carleton College in Minnesota, her master's degree in clinical psychology from the University of Miami in Ohio, and her PhD in clinical psychology from the University of Wisconsin. Dr. Piper began her work at CTRI in 1999 when she collaborated with the Public Health Service Guideline Treating Tobacco Use and Dependence that was published in 2000. She then served as the project scientist for the 2008 PHS guideline update. Our second speaker today will be Abby Rose. Abby Rose is the program manager for Catch Global Foundation, where she is responsible for the development and dissemination of nutrition education, physical activity, youth vaping prevention, and all health promotion programs. Abby is active in Shape America, including serving on their Physical Activity Council and Early Childhood Advisory Group. Previously, Abby was a school wellness specialist in the Office of Student Health and Wellness of the Chicago Public Schools. Her main areas of focus are comprehensive school physical activity programming and early childhood wellness. Abby was the founding PE teacher and director of the Health and Wellness at Namaste Charter School and in a national model of school wellness as a vehicle for student success on the southwest side of Chicago. She holds an MSED from Northwestern University. Welcome to both of our speakers, and I will turn it over to Megan. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, we'll get going with the slides here. Uh, and what I'd like to do, spend the first half of the hour sort of providing an introduction to electronic cigarettes. I don't have any conflicts of interest to disclose. And basically what I'd talk about, like to talk about uh, this morning are first some e-cigarette ba basics, then a little bit about youth use, and then whether or not e-cigarettes are safe. So starting with the basics, 
what is an e-cigarette? So you can see on the picture here, this is a sort of breakdown of the device, the inside of, a, of an e-cigarette device, which is basically something that heats and vaporizes a liquid. So it contains nicotine, um, ideally that was designed to mimic the experience of smoking a conventional cigarette. Originally, these were designed to be a safer cigarette for people to use. So you can see that on the far left in the picture, some, uh, some devices used to have a red uh, light at the end, so it would glow like a cigarette. There's a battery component to all e-cigarettes that are used to uh, power a microprocessor, which heats the element, and that el heated element then vaporizes the juice or the liquid in the cartridge, which is then inhaled through the mouthpiece. There are a large variety of e-cigarettes available. Originally, disposables were the most popular. These are something you would sort of use a couple times and throw away. Then we had the rechargeables. So these, again, still look more like a cigarette. Uh, Sigil-like is what we call them sometimes. Uh, there's a variety of brands, and you can recharge the device itself, and you can use lots of different flavors of juice or types of juice in those kinds of rechargeable e-cigarettes. And then things really started to expand. Uh, primarily because people wanted higher power batteries. <clears throat> Excuse me. With the higher power batteries, you're able to vaporize more liquid and you're able to get more nicotine through the system. So we have things like vape pens on the top left or tank systems right below that. And then something called mods, which became very big sort of a cultural use of e-cigarettes. People could have very high powered batteries. They look very different. They don't look like a cigarette at all anymore. And you could have, as you can see in the picture on the lower right, different color batteries, different color mods um, that people enjoyed playing with. Then we had a bit of a revolution when the pod mods or the salts came on the scene. So this is basically Juul, and then Juul has spun off a lot of similar looking devices. This is when you see somebody holding something that looks like a USB key, um, but then you see a bit of the vapor coming out. And so they have these, plus the ones on the right, which are called the teardrops or the Sorin. These are sort of the revolutionary. They don't look anything like an e-cigarette. Um, and in fact, sometimes when you ask somebody if they're using an e-cigarette, they say, well, no, I just jewel, uh, because it doesn't even look anything like a cigarette anymore. And then to talk a bit about those were the devices, and then to talk a bit about the e-liquids or the juice that goes into the device usually contains propylene glycol and either glycerin or vegetable glycerin, water, nicotine, and flavorings. In 2017, when researchers looked online, they found more than 15,000 different flavors available. <clears throat> you can see here some different examples, uh, vanilla bean, red hot, latte, naked peach rings, uh, creamy tobacco, butterscotch, all sorts of different flavors designed to appeal to a variety of different users. And we'll get into the importance of flavors with youth in a minute. <clears throat> The other important thing that has, uh, that has developed over time is the use of nicotine salts. So the original e-cigarettes, the e-cigarettes that were disposables, the uh, tank systems, those types uh, that use this kind of juice, used something called freebase nicotine. But what they learned when they um, examined the papers from the cigarette developers was that when you add something, when you add the acid, to the freebase nicotine, uh, specifically benzoic acid, you get a smoother hit. So originally, the freebase nicotine was fairly harsh for people to use. It was perhaps as enjoyable. But now that they've created this nicotine salt by adding the acid, nicotine salts provide much more nicotine, but much bigger nicotine hit, and it gets to the brain faster, and it's much more palatable for people to use. So when we talk about pod mods and salts, like Juul and other things like that, they're using a different kind of nicotine, which has increased uh, the popularity dramatically. <clears throat> so that's a bit about what e-cigarettes are. Let's transition for a second into talking about youth use. So uh, nationally, we saw a very promising trend from 2011 to 2019, where we saw a 10 percentage point reduction in cigarette use in the past 30 days among adolescents. Very exciting to see. But this was the problem. We saw a commiserate increase in the use of e-cigarettes. And you'll see that that line was sort of peaking in 2015, coming down in 2016 and 17. But in 2017, that's when Juul hit the market. We now have more than one in five high school students reporting that they have used an e-cigarette in the last 30 days. 
And so we looked at those trends even in Wisconsin, where we're located, and we are seeing the same thing. We're seeing one in, uh, one in five or even one in four uh, high school students using electronic cigarettes with a, with a commiserate decrease in conventional cigarette use. Uh, and that is sort of current use status, but ever use, you see at least in Wisconsin, almost a third of high school students have ever used an e-cigarette, which is double the ever use rates of conventional cigarettes. One of the major reasons that kids are starting to use e-cigarettes is the flavors. More than 80% report that they like it, they use it because it tastes good. They like the flavors that it comes in. And a lot of kids, in fact, two-thirds of teens think that e-cigarettes is just like vaping a flavor. It's steam cleaning your lungs or it's flavored air. It's just a, a rewarding treat to have. They don't understand that there is nicotine in this or that nicotine is an addictive substance. In fact, 80% of high school students in Wisconsin and 95% of the middle school students in Wisconsin would not use a product if it wasn't flavored. And it's easy to see where the flavors become attractive because part of it is marketing. You can see here that if you're interested in vanilla wafers, if that sounds good to you and would taste good to you, that that would be something you would certainly want to try. And why wouldn't you if you think all you're doing is vaping a flavor? Uh, they also market to kids with things that look like Pop-Torts and Pancake Man and popcorn. The e-juice on the bottom looks like cereals that might be in any kid's uh, pantry. And so you can see that many of these flavors are specifically marketed and designed to be appealing to adolescents. So given the fact that we have a product that is more potent than before, that youth are really uh, very, very uh, engaged in using this product, we need to talk about the safety. So typically, uh, adverse events associated with e-cigarette use um, among adults specifically tend to be mouth and throat irritation, some nausea, some headache, and some dry cough. We have much more laboratory and preclinical data, uh, data with some mouse models and some data with epithelial cells, uh, but we don't have a lot of, of human long-term research data. But we do know certain things are problematic. For example, some of the chemicals in the flavors are significantly problematic. Things like diacetyl. Diacetyl is a product, uh, it's a chemical that they use to make things taste buttery, so buttered popcorn, um, a smooth caramel flavor. But we know that when you, it's fine to eat, but we know that when you inhale it, it produces a significant and, and in some cases fatal lung disease. Cinnamon aldehyde is another chemical that can be in flavorings that, has, uh, that is known to cause other health problems. And when you think about it simply from a constituent perspective, what you're putting into your body, we, when we talk about e-cigarette aerosol, it's not harmless. It's not just flavored air. There's formaldehyde, acetylaldehyde. There are nitrosamines. There are volatile organic chemicals. There are particulate matter, all sorts of things that you're breathing into your body when you use an e-cigarette. But we also have to recognize that compared to combustible cigarettes, this is a lot less. So with respect to combustible cigarettes, when you burn a traditional cigarette, you create 7,000 chemicals, more than 50 of which are carcinogenic. And we also um, have exposure then to cyanide, carbon monoxide, and all the others. And so compared to combustible cigarettes, it, uh, they may be less harmful, but they're not harmless. And that's one of the things that's important to recognize in this. The National Academy of Sciences reviewed the research in 2017 um, to try and identify what the health-related consequences are of electronic cigarettes. And this is where the speed of research is just not keeping up with the public health innovations. So you'll notice that this was done in, um, they reviewed papers through August 31st of 2017, and that's about the time that Juul came on board. So here we're talking about a new product with new juice, with different chemistry that perhaps can get deeper into the lungs. So again, really trying to understand the health consequences is a challenge for the scientists. We're trying our best to keep up and trying to figure out what's health, um, what, the, what the outcomes are, but there's so much that we don't know. But in 2017, they were able to conclude that most e-cigarettes contain and emit numerous potentially toxic substances. E-cigarette use can result in symptoms of dependence, but at the time, we just did not have enough evidence that um, regarding the short or long-term health effects of e-cigarette use. 
But this is one of the important uh, components that we need to think about when we think about adolescent use, and that is the effects of nicotine on the developing brain. Myelination in the brain is not complete. Uh, some scientists estimate mid-20s or even as late as the early 30s. And so when you put a psychoactive substance in the brain, specifically when you put it in there repeatedly, and the nicotine is indeed a psychoactive substance, and when you have repeated exposure to nicotine, you actually rewire the brain. You increase the number of nicotine receptors in the brain, and that in turn can increase the risk of impulsivity, which is the last thing adolescents need. It can also increase the risk of mood disorders. It has a significant impact on learning and memory. Uh, it has an impact on reward functioning. So talking to adolescents, we talk about the fact that, yeah, it feels great to vape. That buzz is awesome. But if you still want to enjoy hanging out with your friends, if you still want to enjoy playing the games you play or doing the sports you play, you have to recognize that, that e-cigarettes and addiction to nicotine will sort of take over, and those other things you've enjoyed in life actually become less fun and less enjoyable. Are you willing to rewire your brain so that the rest of life is just not as fun uh, compared to nicotine. And that's, that's something that um, adolescents sometimes makes them stop and think. Um, and then, of course, we have to deal with the fact that you can develop dependence. Again, when you rewire your brain, you develop a, dependent, a dependency. And when you don't have that nicotine from the e-cigarette in your system, you go through withdrawal. Uh, some of the kids these days call it fiending. So an example was given in one um, group that I was talking with about a cheerleader, and they were at this big cheerleading competition, and she was fiending for her e-cigarette. And so the entire team was running around trying to find somebody that had an e-cigarette so she could get a hit so that they could compete. Um, it, you know, it, is, it is definitely a dependence-inducing product uh, and something for us to, to be very aware of. In fact, it's important because a lot of the kids don't know that they're ingesting something that can create dependence. Um, there's also the risk of becoming a, a, com a combustible cigarette smoker. So in, in a 2017 paper that was published in JAMA Pediatrics, they did a meta-analysis and found that kids who vaped were significantly more likely to go on to use a combustible cigarette, which has known negative health effects and known addiction potential. Uh, there was a recent paper that did question that finding a bit. Uh, the, the results... Uh, by Celia did suggest that the kids who went on to smoke may have been the type who would have smoked anyway, even if they hadn't used e-cigarettes first. Um, but it's definitely a concern that if we are developing addiction in kids, it, they may be looking for other ways to get that nicotine hit, and combusted cigarettes provide a very efficient nicotine hit. In fact, uh, when they did the 2016 Surgeon General's report, the Surgeon General at the time, Vivek Murthy, suggested that compared to older adults, the brain of youth at young adults is more vulnerable to the negative consequences of nicotine exposure. The effects include addiction, priming for use of other addictive substances, reduced impulse control, deficits in attention and cognition, and mood disorders. And as he outlined all of these based on what little we knew before Juul, this has only gotten worse um, with the advent of Juul and other pod mods and nicotine salts. I do want to touch briefly on the issue of Evali. So this is electronic cigarette or vaping-associated lung injury. Um, and this is, oh, I'll go back for a second. This is a picture of one of the uh, people who have, had, who have had this disease, and you can see all the white uh, is not supposed to be there. Healthy lung tissue would look gr darker gray. And part of the problem with Evali is there's no, it's a diagnosis of exclusion. There's no specific test or marker. The symptoms can be somewhat vague and common to a lot of different disorders, um, cough, chest pain, abdominal pain, fevers and chills, and indeed death has been found uh, in a few cases. They haven't been able to identi identify any single compound or ingredient that's caused this. Um, however, recently there has been a lot of evidence pointing toward the idea that vitamin E acetate, which is something that they use in THC-related vapes, uh, may be the culprit for these diseases, for these um, events. Uh, the numbers change constantly, but as of November 5th, we had over 200 and, or 2,200 cases um, in 49 states. It had not made it to Alaska. Uh, we had 47 deaths, and about 15% of those um, uh, who are, are diagnosed with Ebola are below the age of 18. And almost all of them are reporting using THC products 
and specifically products obtained through informal sources, so things that they got from family, friends, <clears throat> some sort of vendor, um, but not through a formal store uh, or online order. The nice thing about this is we are starting to see a decrease in the incidence of Evali over time, so that is very promising to see. Um, so that the, it may be that the epidemic is sort of on a downturn right now, now that there's more understanding of what it is that, that was causing the problem. Um, so with respect to the CDC recommendations as a result of the Evali outbreak, they recommended that e-cigarettes or vaping products should never be used by youths, young adults, or women who are pregnant. And that's true whether we had Evali or not. We really do not want e-cigarettes being used by youths or young adults. Uh, they don't want you vaping THC or buying e-cigarettes off the street. They don't want you modifying any products. And they really want everybody to refrain from vaping products. However, they're clear if you're vaping because you're trying to quit cigarette smoking, then they don't want you to return to cigarette smoking. And this is where some of that public health trade-off happens between trying to identify something that might help smokers quit using a known lethal product and uh, use who are developing uh, use on a product. So in conclusion, e-cigarettes have evolved. They've become more popular. They've become more potent. Adolescent e-cigarette use represents a significant public health concern, and flavors are playing a key role in adolescent e-cigarette use. We have limited data on short and long-term health effects for e-cigarette use, um, but we know that they're not harmless. And we know um, that Evali is, is definitely a concern, but that does appear to be linked specifically to THC type vapes and vitamin E acetate. We also know that e-cigarette use with respect to nicotine vapes has a significant consequences, uh, negative consequences on the developing brain and may predispose someone to going on to using combustible cigarettes. So with that, I will be happy to entertain questions. Um, I see uh, that somebody asked about the term fiending. Yes, that is the term that they use when people are craving e-cigarettes, is that they are fiending. Uh, will there be a breakdown of costs for this type of smoking? Um, I'm not sure. Um, we, we can probably work on that. Okay. Um, Sue, that's a really great suggestion, and um, we'll work on getting that pulled together. Wonderful. Um, what drug, uh, compared to this type of addiction, need or symptoms? Um, so nicotine addiction, again, it's a powerful addiction, and there, it's powerful for a few reasons. One, it gets into the brain within approximately six seconds. And anything that gets to the brain quickly is more likely to be addicting uh, because you just get the hit or the rush so very quickly and it's very rewarding. The other reason nicotine addiction is problematic is people are doing it all the time. Kids are doing what they call stealth vaping or stealthing, which means they have the, they're palming the e-cigarette, they're inhaling, and Juul actually produces much less vapor than the earlier products did so that you can do it in the classroom and nobody even sees the the vapor slowly as you exhale. Um, and so the fact that you can do it in every context, you can be doing it all day long, and the fact that it hits your brain so quickly make it a very highly addictive uh, product and make it very challenging to quit. Um, and are there other questions, or should I just keep going down the line? Sure. You can just, I'm, I'm putting them in the Q&A session for you to pull out, so. Okay. Um, do vaping products always contain a minimum nicotine or are there some their only flavor? Uh, there are some e-cigarette uh, liquids that you can buy that are just flavor with no nicotine. However, it's important to know that Juul does not produce a no nicotine product. So a lot of, you know, the vast majority of the products, I think Juul has 75% of the market share for e-cigarettes. And so 75% of the e-cigarettes contain at least some level of nicotine. Uh, when I say dependency, do I mean addiction, permanent brain change occurs? Yes, uh, I tend to use dependence and addiction interchangeably, and it does mean that a brain change occurs. Uh, we don't know for sure that it's permanent, but there is some research to say that once there are more nicotine receptors in the brain, they don't necessarily go away, and if they do, it's pretty slowly. Um, 
what does Evali present like? Um, that's a real challenge. The symptoms include things, I'm just going to pop back to that slide real quick. Um, cough, chest pains, it can look like the flu, fever, chills, and weight loss. Um, and what happened, the reason most people are diagnosed is because of the breathing problems. The significant shortness of breath, a lot of folks end up in the ICU, and it becomes, you know, there's no infection, they can't find signs of any infection, and then they do a very careful, very detailed evaluation of what the person has been ingesting, not ingesting, rather, inhaling, and that's usually when they tend to find that it is some sort of e-cigarette or vaping-related uh, uh, disease. Is there a risk of secondhand smoke like traditional cigarettes? Uh, possibly. At this point, we're not sure. There hasn't been enough research on that, but it is possible that some of the, um, particularly the particulate matter, so this is an aerosol, which means that there are particulates that are suspended um, in the aerosol, and it's possible that those would be available for a, for a non-user to inhale. Um, so not certain about that one yet. Um, somebody asked, I've heard that quitting nicotine is harder than stopping drugs. Is this true? Anecdotally, I have heard that people say they would rather get off heroin again than try to quit nicotine for the reasons I talked about. It's very reliable um, in terms of the hit. You can do it anywhere. It's legal if you're over 18 um, or in some states, I guess, now over 21. But uh, the other problem, too, is this is typically people's first exposure with a drug. So when I work with smokers to help them quit smoking, a lot of times we talk about the fact that you've never had an adult emotion without nicotine in your brain because they've always been a smoker. And so that sort of uh, developmental issue is also a real problem. Um, what's happening with legislation on removing flavors? Um, that was moving forward, and then um, the uh, – it, it has moved forward in certain states, but federally that appears to be on the shelf right now. Um, there was a meeting at the White House, and uh, the result of that appears to be that there's not going to be any flavor legislation at this point. Um, I'm not a policy expert, but that was my understanding. Um, is Evali found in those who use certified mer medical marijuana products and obtained in dispensaries? Um, that's a great question. I don't know the actual, I don't know the details of which um, vape products have been, have come from dispensaries versus other places. I do know that the regulation in those dispensaries is not particularly rigorous, so it's very possible that somebody could have purchased something from a dispensary um, that, that may not have met standards, uh, but I don't know that for sure. Um, are the statistics on the number of fines for stores selling to youth? I'm sure there are. I'm just not aware of those at this point. Um, does the vapor aerosol break down within the lungs just as a moisture would, thus causing liquid within the lungs? Uh, that's a great question. Um, again, I'm not positive of the biology once it's inside the lungs. Um, I don't know that there's actually liquid in the lungs in that way, um, but it's possible. I, I don't have an answer for that, I'm afraid. And is, I don't know if you guys will be able to follow up with any of these questions with a yes, different we expert. will. Okay. We will. And Great. Um, we really appreciate your time. Um, Wonderful. And thank you for answering the questions. Um, we will keep um, a copy of the chat so we can, we can address some of these questions. Um, again, thank you very much. We really appreciate your expertise. All right. Well, and thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. Our next speaker is Abby Rose, um, and I am happy to turn it over to Abby to talk about Catch My Breath. Abby? Um, 
Like I said, we will pull um, these questions from the chat, um, and we will uh, we will see what we can find out. And um, when we send out, we can send out some of the answers as um, kind of an FAQ if we need to. Okay, I think I'm here. Can you guys hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. I'm sorry about that, everybody. Oh, can you hear me now? 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 Okay. 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 Let's see. I muted the speakers, and so hopefully the echo will be taken care of. But now I can't hear you. <laughs> Is this good? Okay. <laughs> Sorry about those technical difficulties, um, and thanks for bearing with me. So as I was mentioning, you know, Megan did such a great job framing the issue, and um, I'm going to kind of take the ball and now, you know, kind of reframe where, um, where Megan left off um, and really talk about how did it get to be so, um, this, this problem of youth vaping, and then highlight our um, evidence-based um, rapid response health ed um, program um, that is hopefully part of the solution. So um, looking back again um, to our youth smoking rates, we were, we were winning the battle with good public health um, and health education. You know, we had been doing a great job in decreasing um, youth rates for, for total, you know, tobacco products, as you can see in this slide and as Megan um, alluded to. So what happened, um, you know, to, to reverse these trends? Um, well, now we know that it was really the advent of um, e-cigarettes. Um, so as Megan mentioned, the um, National Tobacco Survey results from 2018 showed a dramatic increase in youth rates for both middle school and high school students from 2017 to 2018. You know, about a 48% uh, increase in middle school students and a 78% increase for high school students, and that's um, of, of students who reported that they used an e-cigarette in the last 30 days. And really the stark rise during this year um, can most likely be attributed to the, the rise of Juul in the market, um, as Megan was mentioning. So of course, um, you know, one statistic that really scares the public health community is that um, it's been found through a University of Pittsburgh study that young adults who use electronic cigarettes are more than four times as likely to begin smoking tobacco cigarettes within 18 months um, as their peers who did not vape. So, you know, e-cigarettes may be a good off-ramp for some older, longer-term smokers, but they're already an absolutely high, huge on-ramp for new young smokers. Big Tobacco used to call that term replacement smokers um, in the 80s when they were referring to young people they needed to draw into the tobacco use in order to replace customers who were dying off. Um, and so perhaps this link between vaping and smoking pulls the veil back on the tobacco industry and their motives behind their multi-billion dollar investment in e-cigarette companies. For example, um, the company Altria, formerly known as Philip Morris, invested $12.8 billion in Juul. So it's pretty clear that the new, quote unquote, replacement smokers for big tobacco are today's young teenage um, vapors. So when you think about you know, the, the problem and how it's affecting our youth, um, we really thought about when should prevention begin? This chart represents the number of middle and high school students that have ever used e-cigarettes. And this is, again, based on 2017 data from the Youth Risk Behavior Survey. So it's probably 
um, a bit more now um, after you know we've seen those dramatic rises in usage. Um, but looking at this, the optimum time to prevent the onset of health compromising behaviors that Megan was you know describing is the grade before they start becoming prevalent. So nationally, this is nationally representative data. It shows that we should probably start prevention work around fifth grade. Um, we do not have data on e-cigarette usage in elementary school, but again, we are advocating for um, pre prevention. Um, there is caution as to not introduce a behavior that you know younger kids have never thought of. So care must be taken, and educational messages should be limited to establishing a negative attitude attitude towards vaping. Um, but we want to prevent youth from ever picking up that e-cigarette habit to begin with. So um, I want to spend some time talking about. Um, we know that this, you know, we, we're in a crisis with um, our youth vaping. Um, statistics and you know all the problematic um, issues that that brings up from from Megan's presentation but I just want to um, talk for a few minutes about how did it get to be so um, so let's look at um, why you know why why is to why has there been such an increase in usage in in the past years uh, this is a figure from the National Institute of Health showing the knowledge gap that students have about e juice ingredients. And, you know, Megan was talking about this too. A lot of the teens um, that were surveyed just don't understand um, what is, it is they are inhaling um, and that they believe, whether it's wishful thinking or otherwise, that it's just flavoring and it's not harmful for them. Um, so as we've learned, there are many different chemicals in e-cigarette vapor, and more often than not, there is nicotine. Uh, according to the Truth Initiative, 99% of e-cigarettes sold, in 2015 at least, contained nicotine. So mostly even, you know, if they're claiming that they don't have nicotine, 99, up to 99% of them do. Um, manufacturers actually don't have to label or report all the ingredients, so users don't know um, actually what's in them. This lack of knowledge about e-cigarettes makes youth more susceptible to mistruths they may encounter online or hear from their peers. And we'll talk a little bit later about how Catch My Breath arms young people with the facts about vaping so that they can spot mistruths or flat out lies when they see them. A little bit about marketing, um, which is another huge contributor to the increase in the pervasive, you know, um, use of e-cigarettes amongst, amongst youth. Um, according to the National Institute for Health, seven in 10 kids are regularly exposed to e-cigarette advertisements. The charts at the bottom of the screen show a breakdown of where students in middle school, um, that's the light orange color, and high school in the dark orange are being exposed to these ads. The difference between today's marketing and the day of cigarette snaking marketing and social media, that's the difference, the social media aspect. Um, sources like Instagram, YouTube, those are prime examples of where kids are seeing these marketing messages. Um, youth often watch, you know, quote unquote, shows on YouTube, and over the past couple of years, the advertisements have grown um, tremendously in this area. Parents may approve the YouTube show, but they can't control the advertisements their children are seeing. The takeaway here is that the ads are virtually unavoidable. It's important to teach kids to recognize e-cigarette ads, which can be stealthy and subtle in social media, so that they can understand when they are being sold something. And this is another one of the focuses of our program, Catch My Breath. Um, so this is just, you know, kind of a side-by-side -side comparison of, like, the old playbook um, that we saw in, from Big, Big Tobacco and, and showing how it's, you know, kind of coming back again with e-cigarettes. Um, so, you know, you remember the, the slogan, um, I think it was from Virginia Slims, you've come a long way, baby. Uh, well, the e-cigarette companies have, have also, you know, kind of come a long way, and they're just recycling the same messages for the next generation. So using sexy and glamorous women and celebrities, et cetera, um, to advertise. Um, we all recognize this guy, right, the Marble Man. Um, remember how this 
um, you know, image of, of masculinity, helped gain popularity. Um, and there was some discussion about doing a Marble Man-like character and switching him to Easter grads. Um, this campaign actually never came to fruition, and it was just a mock-up that we saw and thought was interesting. But it's a good reminder that um, marketing around e-cigarettes has been sort of a wild west in terms of, like, not being regulated. Um, and, of course, it is uh, worth noting that all the actors, um, according to our information, who portrayed the Marble Man died of lung cancer. So, um, so much for... for um, healthy, you know, <laughs> smoking there. Um, so again, you know, going along this theme, um, just looking at some more examples, here's another example on the left of using sexuality in e-cigarette ads and mirroring the tactics that, you know, Big Tobacco has been using all along um, for traditional cigarettes. Um, the pictures on the right show another mainstay of the tobacco industry marketing, which is sponsorship at music festivals, sporting events, um, really anywhere that they can um, reach young people. Um, members in the tobacco prevention and control community, um, you know, have been trying really hard to eliminate these sponsorships, and they give out free samples of, of different types of tobacco at venues um, where attendees uh, include youth or, you know, folks under the age of 18. Um, before being banned, tobacco brands like Marlboro were big sponsors at IndyCar Racing and NASCAR, and now e-cigarette companies are filling that void. In 2016, tobacco companies spent $9.5 billion on advertising and promotional expenses in the United States alone. That's more than $1 million per hour, 24 hours a day, every day of that year. So you can tell, you know, they're putting big money into this because advertising does work. Um, and so now, you know, Megan did a really great job um, taking a look at specifically Juul and how that really transformed the uh, problem of e-cigarette usage and vaping, especially amongst youth. Um, so, you know, to, to kind of drive that home, this is just a look at when, when Juul was introduced to the market back in, 20, in 2017. Um, in just a little bit over a year, um, it jumped from 24% of the overall e-cigarette market to over 75% in October of 2018. So that's a huge rise and obviously very lucrative um, for, you know, the, that company. And uh, despite all the recent scrutiny in the media and by the FDA, Juul continues to dominate the e-cigarette industry by over 66% percent in the figures from just this September of 2019. So, you know, Juul has, has come under a lot of fire, but they're still um, by far the most popular type of, of e-cigarette. And of course, you know, they've sort of marketed it as this um, lifestyle product, um, and they've made all kinds of accessories and different things to make it more fashionable. Many companies have created jewel wraps or skins, as pictured on the right. Um, they come in almost anything you can imagine, from, you know, Marvel Comics to Louis Vuitton and, you know, different types of brands. Um, and we've actually even seen one with a picture of Mary and Jesus, which is really sad. Um, even Etsy shops have hopped on the jewel bandwagon with trendy hand-knitted jewel cozies. That's, you know, the picture on the left there. Um, so perhaps the most shocking is the emergence of, of clothing. You can see the young lady in the middle um, that is, is specifically designed to conceal vaping devices. As Megan was saying, you know, it's really easy now with this product to hide um, the usage because you know, the, there's not the, the smell that you associate with regular combustible cigarettes and not even as much vapor. So, um, you know, using this clothing to conceal their, their usage um, is another sort of offshoot of this problem. Um, so is that student chewing on the drawstring of their hoodie or are they, you know, taking a, a hit off their jewel? It's hard to know um, in this, you know, day and age. Um, and in fact, um, some folks, some 
students uh, and youth are, are creating themselves different ways uh, to conceal their usage. So, for example, this is a, something that we came across um, in our work. It looks like a Sharpie uh, that any student might have on their keychain or in their backpack, but take a closer look. It was a Sharpie at one point, but, um, you know, someone took the marker out and hid a jewel uh, by inserting it into where the marker used to be. And this was an actual, you know, product that was confiscated from a student in a school that we came across. So um, now that we've covered um, sort of why is this a problem um, and how did it get to be so pervasive uh, so quickly, I want to introduce um, our program, um, which is called Catch My Breath. Um, the theoretical background for Catch My Breath um, is the social cognitive theory which views health behaviors as a product of personal, social, and environmental factors. In addition to building knowledge, Catch My Breath disrupts normative beliefs, such as the notion that everybody is doing it. Students develop skills to help them resist peer pressure and see through advertising and misinformation that perpetuates online and in social media. And as a whole, the program creates favorable attitudes and beliefs about not using e-cigarettes. The program was designed by our lead researcher, Dr. Stephen Kelder, who is a professor at the University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston School of Public Health. Dr. Kelder was a senior scientific editor of the Surgeon General's report on youth e-cigarette use that came out in 2016, which many of you may have read. Why is that important? Um, it's because the mission of the Department of Health and Human Services is to enhance and protect the health and well-being of all Americans. Furthermore, the office has stated, to protect young people from initiating or continuing the use of e-cigarettes, actions must be taken at the federal, state, and local levels. It is imperative that we come together as a nation at all levels to prevent youth from becoming addicted to vaping and other nicotine products. So, you know, we're really happy to have Dr. Kelder on our side um, because he's, he's one of the a premier, you know, scientist studying this problem, and um, he was moved to create Catch My Breath in response. So um, Catch My Breath is free to all schools across the nation, thanks to our partners at CVS Health Foundation. In 2014, as many of you may know, CVS took all tobacco products out of their stores and dedicated $50 million for, a five, year, for five years towards youth tobacco prevention. Since 2017, Catch Global Foundation has been funded as a part of this initiative, and our goal was to reach about 200,000 youth by 2020. Well, um, guess what? <laughs> We've far surpassed that, um, mostly because there's been such a huge need and um, demand for um, this, you know, a solution or response to to this crisis. Um, since we began our broader dissemination efforts with the support of CVS Health, the program has been adopted by schools across 49 states. And actually, we need to update this because we just got our last date um, in the past few years, which was Delaware, in case you were wondering. Um, but they, we, we now have a Delaware school on board. So we can now say we're in all 50 states. Um, and we've reached more than 320,000 students. Um, thanks to a diverse community of support that includes private foundations, local health departments, local or state uh, education agencies, and school districts. By ad adopting the program at school, um, you know you you will be joining more than 100, 1,100 other middle and high schools that have decided to fight back against the risk of e-cigarette epidemic. I see a little question there asking about Canada um, and, and it being free as well. We are looking at our international friends. And yes, I believe in Canada we are able to provide the program for free. Um, we are sort of in the midst of, of looking at other countries beyond Canada. Um, but I can cover that more in the question and answer uh, section as well later. Um, so as you can see, oh, sorry. Um, so later this year, or actually probably early next year, we'll be um, coming out with publication of our peer-reviewed research paper. 
um, that is an analysis of the Catch My Breath program impact. Based on the findings that will, will be presented, um, I want to give you just an idea of what this program could do for your school um, and schools across the country. So the average seventh grader our seventh grade class, I should say, in the, in the U.S., in, in a public school, is approximately 192 students. Um, if we do nothing um, to prevent e-cigarette usage, 17 of those seventh graders will try an e-cigarette by the end of this 2019-2020 school year. However, if a school implements Catch My Breath, eight of those 17 students, 45% of them, will be prevented from trying an e-cigarette or it will not try an e-cigarette this school year. If every public school in the country implemented Catch My Breath, that would be 153,600 fewer seventh grade kids um, that would be trying e-cigarettes alone. So, um, you know, and this data is, is from our study that we did a few years ago. So being that there's increase in overall usage, we um, can infer that, that those numbers would even potentially be higher in terms of the impact. Um, we have been um, privileged to be cited in a lot of national news coverage. Obviously, last summer especially, um, the e-cigarette use crisis became a big topic in the media, and um, you know we were lucky enough to, to be cited in, in multiple different um, national and local news stories. Um, again, we have more <laughs> that we haven't added to this presentation, but um, it continues to be a um, very hot topic, and um, you know we're, we're continuing to, to engage there. Um, so a bit about um, standards alignment and just kind of digging into the program itself. Um, you know, we recognize that if we want folks in schools to teach uh, this program, it has to be standards aligned. So you can see that we've, we've worked hard to make sure to align with national academic standards as well as um, common core standards and also the social emotional learning standards associated with the group CASEL. Um, so hopefully that fits in with, with most every educator's um, requirements there for help ed. Um, Catch My Breath is available for elementary, middle, and high schools. Schools can choose to implement the program in any grade or all grades and as each you know track as a standalone module. The program consists of four lessons that each take between 35 and 40 minutes, which is you know basically a class period. We recommend schools deliver one lesson per week over the course of four weeks, though we leave the delivery time up to the educator. The lessons are a combination of teacher presentations and peer-facilitated small group discussions and projects. Catch My Breath has extensive teacher materials to make the program delivery straightforward and as easy as possible. In fact, our pilot study results showed that 91% of teachers felt confident in their ability to deliver the lessons. We reach such a high teacher confidence level by providing PowerPoints with slide-by-slide -slide scripts that guides the teacher through every step. The training, um, there is training, teacher training that is available both, you know, sort of online and, um, or, you know, in, 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 as an in-person training. There are many different educational strategies used throughout the program that enable students to learn at any level. One of the most favorite um, lessons by both teachers and students is the peer-to-peer -peer module, which uh, you know we can take a look at a little bit later. The program is completely online, which allows teachers from any area to implement the program. And the program also offers pre and post surveys, um, but th those are not mandated to do. But if teachers were interested to see you know, the results from, from pre and post surveys, um, you know, that is available. Um, let's see here, I know I'm running out of time, so I want to make sure I get to everything. Um, this just shows all the different sort of areas within a school where um, Catch My Breath can be implemented. 
Um, we even created a PE supplement because we know a lot of our PE t teachers are responsible for um, teaching health ed. So we wanted to make sure to provide some physically active um, lessons as well. So just to give you a little bit of an overview on the different breakdown of, of the, the different grade levels, um, all of the grade levels focus on disrupting the norm that youth believe everyone or many people are using e-cigarettes. And also in creating favorable attitudes and beliefs about not using e-cigarettes. In the elementary and middle school, we focus on developing skills to resist peer pressure uh, and an understanding of the different types of marketing that um, exists that we highlighted and how tobacco and e-cigarette industry are marketing and advertising to youth. And then in the high school program, we build on that by focusing on the consequences of using e-cigarettes and why policies, laws, and regulations are in place to protect youth. And then the students take a look at policies that protect uh, the youth um, in, within their school, city, state, and you know, federally. Um, just a little teacher feedback. I won't read the quote because we're running out of time, but um, you know you can see um, some great testimonials here. This is my favorite. You know, obviously coming from um, a child in eighth grade, having gone through our program, um, now having understanding about um, e-cigarettes. And um, this one is really great too. This is one of our lessons in in the um, one of the modules, and it's showing. You know, this is from a senior in Illinois who reported that after going through our program, quote, I choose to, chose to do it, but after recent thoughts and ideas in this class have chosen to stop. And that's really what it's all about. Um, so, you know, this is just what it looks like, basically a lesson online. Um, we are running out of time, so we're going to kind of just run to how do I get it? Uh, where do I go? Um, just go to um, catchmybreath.org click enroll to create an account. Uh, you don't have to be a school person to create an account. Um, and then you can have access to all of the information. Um, so, you know, if we had more time, we could go through a little bit more of the enrollment process, but it's fairly easy. Um, and we do ask some information about who is using the program. Um, and then, you know, all of the, I, the materials um, and resources are available online. Please do follow up with me if you have questions um, or want more information about the program, and I am happy to follow up with you. Wonderful. Thank you, Abby. Um, we do have a couple of questions. Um, there was, um, how do we get this information out to the public? Yeah, that is a great question. Um, you know, we try to do a lot of social media. We um, talk to our networks, and through, you know, we're, we're pretty connected through um, our 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 partners in health and ed the health and education world. But um, you know, we are looking actually for for help in in targeting parents mainly and and people in the general public and understanding. Um, that this is a problem and that we need good health education. Um, so if anyone um, has ways to communicate about our program that we haven't thought of, we're very interested in working with other organizations to get the word out. Great. Um, one, another question is, have you reached into tribal schools? Because this is a big issue on the Great Plains Reservation. Wow, it's interesting that you mentioned that. Um, we just read about um, one of the tribes up in northern Michigan just received a grant um, through a nonprofit um, to target, you know, youth vaping on their um, lands, and they chose Catch My Breath. So, you know, we've reached out to them, but that's sort of the first um, time we've, we've really uh, encountered that. But, yes, um, we would love to, to work more, you know, if, if anyone has connections with folks in those areas. Um, to put us in contact with them. That's awesome. Um, just two more questions. Has there been pushback to take um, more precious school time to present Catch My Breath? 
That is a great question. Um, there's always competing priorities within schools, and if you, and you know if anyone's worked within a school or in, within education, there's too much to do with too little time. There's you know um, a lot of focus on testing and these different things. Um, so in, in terms of health education in general being included in the curriculum, it's always a fight. Um, but honestly, with um, so much media attention and and principals, administrators, teachers, parents being really alarmed about this particular issue, um, you know, it, it definitely is getting traction. One thing we are challenged by is that schools want an easy solution. So they're like, oh, can we do this program as an assembly or as a one day, you know, kind of presentation? And we maintain that, you know, to be effective. And what we've seen with our study is that, you know, you really have to do all four lessons. Um, and that's just good health education. So, you know, that's always a struggle, and people just don't have time. But, you know, hopefully four lessons is not going to um, impact too much the rest of the curriculum. Great. Uh, the last question is, um, is the curriculum in Spanish or the slides? We are working on some translation. Um, we, we've done translating in our other obesity prevention work, and that is sort of on our list of, of items. So coming soon, um, we've just you know been in sort of rapid response mode in terms of getting it out and, and disseminated um, and meeting the demand that we, we've been having. But we understand especially our, our um, we're headquartered in Texas, so that's definitely a um, you know, a demand there in Texas, and um, we are hoping to get more Spanish translation materials. I think some of our parent materials are already in Spanish, um, but in terms of the lessons and the student-facing materials, they're not yet um, translated. Okay. And I just want to quickly remind everyone, um, thank you for those of you who stayed on. Um, we have another webinar on how Catch My Breath is being used in an Eau Claire High School next Wednesday, 11 to 12. Um, so if you have not already signed up for that, please go um, to our website and sign up. Otherwise, um, we hope that you all have a great day. Thank you very much for attending, and we look forward to seeing you again next week.